Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Virtually Gone by Jackie Bigar, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue. Emily Carter shifted the backpack on her shoulder and trudged down the trail toward her parents' house. She hated arguing with Alex, but he didn't understand. No one did. The wind gusted, whispering through the treetops as the trunks creaked and dropped pine cones like well-aimed bombs. Emily huddled into her hoodie and swiped away her tears. Her emotions were all over the place the last couple of weeks since finding out about... Her parents were going to be disappointed in her. Between the slipping grades and now this, she'd be lucky if they didn't ship her off to a private school whether she was 16 and old enough to make her own decisions or not. Alex was being a jerk. She had a feeling he was going to break up with her soon. She should have known he was only interested in one thing. Guys were impossible. He'd been her first real boyfriend. She'd fallen headlong in love and thought he had too. More fool her. The lights placed sporadically along the paved trail clicked on, their glow, golden glow trying and failing to keep the night at bay. Emily picked up the pace, already anticipating her mother's reaction to her tardiness. If Alex had given her a ride like he'd promised, she wouldn't be walking home in the dark on a chilly autumn night. She'd been battling nausea for the last week or so anyway. The last thing she needed was to catch a cold. A figure appeared on the path, walking her way, and she suddenly became aware of how deserted the trail seemed today. Normally, the well-used galloping goose was a hub for students traveling back and forth to school and bikers taking advantage of the handy shortcut to get to work. She kept her head down and hurried along, disquiet replacing her anger with Alex. They met in one of the circles of light, and she had the weird sensation she was in a play and didn't know the words. The other person nodded a greeting, and, but like her, wore a dark hoodie that obscured his features. A moment later, they separated, each going their own way. Emily heaved a quick sigh to relieve her tension. No wonder her mom told her to quit watching those horror movies. They turned everyday occurrences into nightmares. When she got home, she'd... The pain came from nowhere. One minute Emily was thinking about a hot bath, and the next she was on her hands and knees, her head swimming with the force of the blow. A pair of dark sneakers came into view, and she had the random thought they were just like the ones her brother wanted for his birthday. A gloved hand grasped her throat and dragged her to her feet. "'You're just like the others,' a disembodied voice whispered. "'You all think you're too good for me. I've been watching you, Emily. I know what you did.' Scared out of her mind, she tried to get a look at her attacker's face, but he wore a black ski mask. All she could see were glowing eyes and obscene red lips puckered up like a goldfish. But that voice, the lisp, could it be? P -p Please let me go. I won't tell anyone. I promise. She wet herself, the warm liquid between her legs turning her pants cold and clammy. Stupid. She was so stupid to have let herself get into this situation, but she wasn't above begging. Please. My dad has money. I know he'd give you anything you want. Just let me go. He pinched her head, neck harder, his fingers like a vice, and her vision tunneled as she struggled to breathe. Daddy can't help you get out of this one, little girl. You have everything I want right now. Time to play. He grabbed her breast through the sweatshirt and gave it a vicious twist at the same time as he bit her bottom lip. You're going to like what I have. Just you wait and see. Blood flooded her mouth, gagging her even as she fought for enough air to scream. He was going to rape her. She could see it in his feral eyes. He dragged her off the path and down to the ground. He was rough. Cruel. The pain was overwhelming. And then she knew. She wasn't going to live. He was going to kill her. Chapter 1 Detective Matthew Roy crouched near the side of the Galloping Goose Trail and carefully searched the perimeter for evidence. Crime scene techs had cordoned off this location and were photographing the area one quadrant at a time, setting out markers for virtually every bent blade of grass, but he liked to do his own searches. Call him overcautious, but he figured the more eyes on the prize, the better the results. This was the third such assault in a matter of weeks, and it was setting the city of Victoria on edge. Notices had gone out not to walk alone, get rid of earbuds while jogging, he hated the damn things anyway, and stay off the paths after dark whenever possible. 
for all the good it had done. He frowned at the dim streetlight, creating more shadows than clarity, even with the clag lights they had set up, and the undergrowth creeping onto the borders of the path. The perfect hunting grounds for his perp. Fifty-five kilometers of paved footpaths with access to a multitude of entry and exit points. The guy was smart. Assuming it was a male, though Matt knew better than to jump to conclusions, he always used protection which he took with him, kept his head low, wore a dark cap and oversized clothing to mask his size, and the M.E. was 98% certain he shaved all body hair. They hadn't found even one follicle on any of the victim's bodies, which left Matt batting zero. Hey, detective, got a minute? Got a minute? He closed his eyes and drew a deep breath. He liked and admired his partner's new girlfriend, but the last thing he felt like doing was playing nice for the press. Can't, Jules. I'm busy. He didn't have to turn his head to see her disapproval. It bore a hole through his shoulders. Come on, Roy. The public have a right to know what's going on. They need to be notified. That did it. He rose and swiveled on his feet to stomp over and get in her face, heedless of the camera crew waiting in the wings. What in the H-E-double-L do you think we've been doing, he roared. Connor had warned him about taking cases like these personally, but damn it, it was personal. This young woman had a family somewhere, maybe even a husband and children who would never get to see her or tell her how much they loved her again. Damn right it was personal. Julie jumped backward, her expression frightened before she could wrestle him under control. And now he felt like an ass. Of course she was scared. A serial killer had stalked her just as this rapist case was getting underway. Connor had taken lead on the investigation and damn near lost his life. She gazed at him with worried eyes before turning to her crew and slicing a hand across her throat. Give us a minute, guys. I'll call you when I'm ready. The group looked at each other, shrugged, and gathered their gear, moving to stand beside the VIBS news van. When she returned her attention to Matt, determination overrode the fear. You want to tell me what has you so riled up? She raised her hand. And yes, it's off the record. No, he did not want to tell the pretty reporter the story of his life, thank you very much. He trusted Julie as much as he did most of the individuals in his life, with the exception of Connor, which was to say, with a bag of salt. He found people tended to say what they thought you wanted to hear, not what they actually meant. In his line of work, there was a stark contrast between the two, which meant he kept to himself safer that way. On the other hand, this was Jules. She'd been through some tough times of her own, and so he made an effort to tone down his frustration. I don't like it when I can't keep my city safe, he admitted. He angled sideways so he could keep an eye on the text. This guy, it's like he's always one step ahead of us, you know? She leaned over the yellow ribbon and patted his two-tenths arm. You'll get him, Matt. I know you will. Then she straightened and donned her investigative reporter face. Can VIBS get a short statement from you? It doesn't have to give away anything. Just let the public know you're working on it, okay? Matt sighed. She was like a pit bull with a piece of meat. Yeah, okay. Let's get it over with. I have a case to get back on. At least she didn't shove her success down his throat. She simply nodded and called her camera crew to get ready and did something with her hair, twisting the length of it into a loose knot that somehow looked more professional. A microphone was shoved into her hand, and then they were alive. This is Julie Crenshaw with the Vancouver Island Broadcasting System. We are in a wooded area near Harbor Road on the Galloping Goose Trail. Normally a well-used path through the city for cycling and jogging enthusiasts, tonight it became the location of a deadly assault. The camera panned from her earnest face to Matt. Standing beside me is Detective Matthew Roy. Can you inform the public of what happened here and whom you might be searching for? Matt gave the usual canned response of where she'd been hoping for more. It's too early in the investigation to give out information that could jeopardize the case. A body was located just a few feet away on the side of the trail, but we won't know whether it is a suspicious death or not until the medical examiner makes his report. Julie fired back. Isn't it true that there have been other recent attacks on women using this trail? Damn it, she was going to incite a riot if she kept this up. Matt shot her a glare. I repeat, it is too early to determine the cause of death in this case. If there is a reason for concern, we will certainly inform the public. Until then, we strongly suggest traveling in pairs and avoiding dark places at night. It's common sense to be careful. 
Jules narrowed her eyes at that. Sound advice, detective. Would you say the crime rate in Victoria has risen in the past couple of years? And why? A tech collected a piece of evidence off the trail and bagged it before carrying it over to the M.E. crouch near the body of the young woman. She hadn't died easily. He just needed one solid lead. Maybe then, Detective Roy... He jerked and then cursed at getting caught off guard. Crime is on the rise everywhere, Miss Crenshaw. I guess you and I have job security, don't we? He tuned out whatever she said next, his attention on the sealed evidence bag. Maybe now the hunt could begin. Chapter 2 Julie sat at her computer in the madhouse that was VIBS headquarters and tried to concentrate. Something about the way Matt had avoided her questions bothered her. Of course, it was the part of the dance journalists and the police did on a regular basis. Death was always awful, but this seemed different. If only she could put her finger on it. Hey, dollface, what do you have there? Henderson invaded her personal bubble to watch the playback of her interview with the detective. Julie frowned at the cutesy name tag, but moved aside so Ron could see. When she'd first transferred here from Chicago, the chip on her shoulder had clashed with the laid-back attitude of the station's lead reporter. It had taken a near-death experience, her second one, to make her realize he was a good guy under all that persuasive charm. She eyed the half-eaten donut in his hand, and her stomach grumbled, reminding her she'd been running late this morning and hadn't stopped to eat. And then she remembered why she'd been running late and smiled. Of course, he caught the lustful look in her eyes and attributed it to his food. He shoved the thing in his mouth and swallowed it down. Sorry I'd share, but but you're a pig, she said, humor restored. And furthermore, it was your turn to buy. Hey, he threw his hands in the air, sending grains of sugar scattering. I did buy. They just didn't make it through the door. His smile was pure mischief and had the desired effect of making her laugh. That's better, he said. You were looking grim when I arrived. She sobered and nodded toward the screen, frozen on a seemingly peaceful bridge with broadleaf maples shading the, the walkway. There was another sexual assault, she said. The victim didn't survive this time. Ron stared at her for a moment before using his foot to tug an office chair from across the cluttered aisle to her side. He sat, knees butting into hers, and grasped her hands. Listen, Jules, I know you want to do your job, but after what you've been through, maybe you should give this one a pass. He was talking about the ABC killer who'd almost taken her life, of course. But he hadn't, and it was all the more reason she needed to investigate stories like these. If she could save just one woman from the terror she'd felt or the horror the woman today had gone through, it was up to her to do that. A calling, almost. Besides, if it was Ron, he would never quit. I can't, she said simply. He took in her determined expression and leaned back chair creaking under his six four body. Okay, I get that, but no going it alone this time. You heard Monroe. She'll can your hide if you pull something like that again. Taylor was her best friend. They'd gone to school together in Chicago. She knew what Julie had been through and was protective. Overly so, at times. Connor, as well. A warmth spread through her chest. He'd been so romantic this morning. With the boys away to her parents' home, they'd been able to properly celebrate their commitment to each other. She was moving on, the death of her husband and child an ache inside instead of the chasm in her heart of the first few months. All the more reason not to take chances. I can't let this one go, but I'm willing to accept half the credit if you're interested. If he agreed, Julie intended to send him to the VICPD for an update. It was hard for her to go there now that she was dating a detective. The last thing she wanted was any hint of collusion to ruin either her her credibility or a case's chance for a fair trial. Nice to hear you two getting along for a change. Did you plan on asking if I could spare Henderson, or were you doing my job again? Taylor stood behind them, arms crossed, and a vexed look in her normally friendly green eyes. Shoot. Julie and Ron split apart like a couple of naughty school kids. With all the noise in this place, she'd failed to notice the boss's arrival. And that's what Taylor was right now. She didn't want to lose her job. She had some explaining to do. I was going to come to your office as soon as I had a firm lead. Ron was just reminding me of your warning about dangerous investigations. I would have talked to you before doing anything. Honest. Ron stared at his folded hands resting on his flat stomach. No help there, the big chicken. Tyler, Taylor eyed the frozen computer screen. Is that the murder detective Roy picked up this morning? 
Of course she knew. Taylor had connections. Julie nodded. I can explain. How did you... Never mind. Did you take a team with you? Taylor strode between them to restart the video. Yes, we didn't get much, though. I was just contemplating my next move when Henderson arrived and ruined my mojo. At least that got a fleeting smile. Taylor turned back to the screen. The galloping goose again? Julie nodded. Yeah, third one in as many months. The first two victims won't talk. I'll get them to talk, Ron said, apparently done inspecting his belly button. Julie kicked him behind Taylor's back. Cut it out. I swear you'd think you two were related, Taylor muttered, her focus intent on the screen. Come to think of it, whenever Taylor and Matt were in the same room, which happened now and then since they were her and Connor's best friends, there was a weird vibe in the room. Julie vowed to bring it up with Taylor after work. When the video ended on the victim's body covered in a white sheet, a pall felt fell over the three of them until Ron reached over and clicked off the screen. Taylor turned and leaned against the desk, her skin pale. Okay, let's catch this asshole.